Welcome to Tell Me Your Truest Story. I'm Karen Miriam Goldberg. This monthly podcast focuses on exploring, unearthing, and at times revising the stories we tell ourselves and are told to find greater freedom, justice, wisdom, and homecoming. Explore with us ways to better align our narratives with our callings and the callings of our time and the living earth. Harriet Lerner, in her best-selling The Dance of Anger, writes, Letting go of anger and hate requires us to give up hope for a different past, along with the hope of a fantasized future. What we gain is a life more in the present, where we are not mired into prolonged anger and resentment that doesn't serve us. This quote resonates with the time we're in now, Caught in a seemingly endless, polarized, and polarizing world where too much is predicated on requiring a different path and a fantasized future, rather than looking closely at the story we're living now. I knew Harriet's books before I knew Harriet. My copy of The Dance of Connection and The Mother Dance opened so many times that pages were falling out. As the author of 10 life-changing and life-saving books for adults, as well as several charming children's books, Harriet is known as one of the most foundational and beloved, hey, she's even Brene Brown's greatest influence, psychologists and writers in the world. Her words aloud and on the page turn the tables on what it means to be in a relationship and to grow your own authenticity and agency, showing millions the importance of changing what you can in yourself by changing the story, especially the story you tell yourself. Like me, Harriet grew up in Brooklyn and she writes on her website that she also grew up in a family that understood the benefits of therapy. Her mother, she writes, even in the hardest economic times, she made sure that we had four things that she believed were essential to our later success. One, good shoes. I don't mean stylish. Two, a firm quality mattress. Three, a top pediatrician, none other than Dr. Benjamin Spock, for a therapist. Harriet and her husband, Steve, lived for years in Topeka, where she was associated with the Menningers Foundation, and she was also in private practice. When she moved to Lawrence, we became fast friends, meeting regularly for walkie-talkies, trying to get in at least three miles of moseying and strolling while catching up on our lives and writing. Here is my interview with her. Thank you so much for being here, Harriet. My pleasure. Well, as you know, this podcast focuses on finding, telling, and even amplifying our truest stories, which is my shorthand way of saying who we really are, what we truly feel called to do in this world. So I so much wanted to speak to you because a lot of your writing has kind of called me to the carpet. I'm looking at the stories I tell myself about relationships and change, control and fear, and especially anxiety and uncertainty. Um, I believe the more we examine the stories behind what we tell ourselves about how we live and who we are, the more freedom we can glean to really arrive at the present with each other. And also the more I understand my own crazy and sometimes crazy making habits, the more I can meet those I'm in relationships with, um, such as my husband, kids, friends, from a cleaner space. You wrote The Dance of Anger, a book that was initially rejected for five years and now has sold, whoa ho, over 3 million copies with over 35 foreign editions. And in that book, you wrote, we cannot make another person change his or her steps to an old dance, but we can change our own steps, the dance that no longer can continue in the same predictable pattern. So, so hey, Harriet, let's talk about anger. The stories we tell ourselves or our culture tells us. And anger, as you and I have talked about, especially for women or people who are marginalized, 
is often seen as a negative emotion. But first, what led you to write early on in your career about anger? And actually, what's the story behind the story about what led you to become a writer? Well, I guess if we went way back, I started keeping a diary, one of those lock and key diaries. I think we talked about this, Karen, didn't we, at some event? I think we did at some point, yes. Yeah, and the diary was very helpful to me uh, because I would write in it every day. So I began to see writing as just an ordinary practice. And what's interesting is that my diaries, and I have a lock and key diary for every year, through elementary school and middle school and um, actually through high school. And my diaries show no talent. You know, there's no evidence Mm -hmm. of creativity or writing ability, but it, I wrote, you know, and, and that's what you have to learn to do. If you're a writer, I was never viewed as having any writing talent until I guess in college, Um, but then once I actually in Topeka at at Menninger's, I became very interested in women's anger and I just started writing about it. Wow. Well, you know, I have a similar story. If you look over my older poetry, Oh my, it is so, so bad. You would never think Uh I would go on to keep writing poetry and write better poetry. But, you know, sometimes we're led places we didn't expect. And I'm particularly interested in what you say about anger and in the dance of anger. Um, You have the subtitle, A Woman's Guide to Changing the Patterns of Intimate Relationships. So, I try not to quote giant hunks from people, but this quote from you in that book is so important that I just have to share it all. Great. Thank you. Why are angry women so threatening to others? If we are guilty, depressed, or self-doubting, we stay in place. We do not take action except against our own selves, and we are unlikely to be agents of personal and social change. In contrast, angry women may change and challenge the lives of all as witnessed in the past decade of feminism. And change is an anxiety arousing and difficult business for everyone, including those of us who are actively pushing for it. Thus, we learn to fear our own anger, not only because it brings about the disapproval of others, but because it signals the necessity for change. We may begin to ask ourselves questions that serve to block or invalidate our own experience of anger. Is my anger legitimate? Do I have the right to be angry? What's the use of my getting angry? What good will it do? These questions can be an excellent way of silencing ourselves and shutting off our anger. And I have to say, I was asking some of those questions out loud with my therapist six months ago. So those questions die hard. So there's a story, an underlying narrative in our culture about women and anger. Could you say more? Well, one of the stories about women and anger is that women who express anger, especially if we are taking up a women's cause like feminism, that these women women are unfeminine, unladylike. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I was raised with that sugar and spice, um, the nice lady that that we were taught that the nice lady gives in and goes along and accommodates and doesn't rock the boat. So that when I was writing the dance of anger, and I think this is still true, society was so uncomfortable with angry women and women were taught 
to cultivate guilt and feelings of inadequacy like a little flower garden because angry women were so threatening. And, you know, even Karen, if you think about the, our language, the words we have to describe mm-hmm. women who voice anger at men, you know, we're witches, bitches, hags, nags, shrews, castrating, ball breaking, strident. So the story that we learn to tell ourselves is, um, well, we certainly didn't want to call ourselves feminists because we didn't want to be seen as one of those angry women. When indeed it's quote, those angry women who have really changed and challenged the lives of all of us. Mm -hmm. So we've had to unlearn that story um, that we needed to avoid anger at all costs and hold relationships in place as if our our lives depended upon it. Yeah, no, it's really interesting to hear you say all this. And of course, I'm loud, proud and feminist and... uh, I'm thinking you may be too, Um, but I also can't help thinking that you wrote this book. Well, it came out at least in 1985. You probably wrote it beforehand. And here we are with a woman vice president who had to be kind of careful not to appear too angry. And of course, in the previous election, um, Hillary Clinton had to constantly walk that line of trying not to look too angry while her opponent was uh, a whole lot of anger. Do you see any shift in our culture with this narrative over time? Well, there are shifts in our culture and certainly women feel more empowered to, um, to be angry for a woman's cause. Although I still hear to this day Um, that women will say, well, I believe in equal rights, but I don't want to call myself a feminist because I'm not one of those angry women, you know, as if still we're, you know, we're back, back in time. There's, there's a French saying that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And really, the reason that the dance of anger has stood the test of decades is that while things have changed a lot, in some ways, of course, they've remained the same. And I should also add that although one of the stories we've learned to tell ourselves, which is that we shouldn't get angry, that, of course, was very problematic because... Um, you know, when we give in and go along and accommodate and don't rock the boat and avoid anger and conflict at all costs, we suffer. And we suffer not only because we avoid conflict, we suffer because we avoid any clear statement of self that is going to rock the boat. So we avoid saying things like, you know, mom, I see it differently. You know, I see the situation with dad differently. Let me tell you how I see it. In other words, we avoid clearly sharing our differences. And what happens then is that we get into a de-selfed position where too much of ourself our beliefs, our desires, our wants, our priorities, um, they get sacrificed in order to preserve relationship harmony. And this leads to all kinds of problems. So that was the nice lady category that I was raised on. Mm -hmm. But there's another side to the story. And I talk about this in The Dance of Anger too which is that many of us get angry with ease, but getting angry gets us nowhere. So we get caught up in endless cycles of fighting 
and blaming and complaining that lead to no constructive resolution. And in this way, anger also narrows and distorts the stories that we tell about ourselves and other people. Because whether, and by the way, Karen, you, I think I told you that, you know, in one of our many walkie talkies, I think I told you that the original title of the dance of anger was nice ladies and bitches, a woman's guide (laughs) to anger. And that was my working title because that captures the two categories of mismanaging anger that get us into trouble. You know, the nice lady who can't get angry at all, the quote bitch who fights, but she fights ineffectively. And really the outcome of both of these things, the outcome is the same, that the woman is left feeling helpless and powerless and nothing changes. And we get stuck in a very narrow story, both about herself and the other person and the relationship. So anger is really a very tricky emotion because while anger signals a problem, venting anger does not solve it and does not lead us to a more authentic and larger, more generous view of who we are. Yes, and that's really helpful to hear in that context. Um, I couldn't help thinking that um, another thing that happens to anger is that it gets turned inward. inward. And um, as an expert on fixation and rumination about what makes me angry, (laughs) there's also that. So I want to ask you several follow-up questions to what you just said. One is, you did in your book say anger is a signal and one worth listening to. And I was thinking as you were talking about how on a cultural level, we have somebody like Greta Thunberg, who is an angry female child. I guess she's getting into being a woman now who would express her anger incredibly effectively as a signal, as a warning cry. And that's more on the cultural level and the global level. But what can anger be a signal for when it comes to people's sense of power or lack of power in relationships? Anger can be a signal of just about anything, um, which is why it's so tricky because, okay, let's start with what's positive about anger. Anger is a very, very important positive emotion for two reasons. One is that it helps us to define the self, to define who we are apart from what others need and expect us to be. So our anger can help us to to say, this is what I think, this is what I feel, these are the things I will not will and will not do. You know, this is the ground I walk on. So just like physical pain tells us to take our hand off the hot stove, the pain of our anger preserves the very dignity and integrity of the self. And the other reason that anger is so positive is the one we've been talking about that it's a powerful vehicle for change, whether it's personal change, whether it's challenging what's happening with that climate change that you mentioned, it's a powerful vehicle for change. So when you say, when you ask the, the very good question, let's say I feel angry, you know, and you're saying, well, what is anger signaling? That's what's so tricky because anger is something we feel, but it does not tell us what the real issue is or what we should do about it. So we might, I might be feeling angry because my rights are being violated. I might be angry because I'm not 
being treated as a worthy person. I'm not being treated with kindness and respect. I might be angry because I am doing too much for some other person. I'm doing more than I can comfortably give or do. Or I might be angry because someone else is doing too much for me. You know, they're over-functioning for me and it's really at the expense of my development and, and my growth. Or I might be angry just because I'm having a really low self-esteem day and I'm just really anxious and feeling bad about myself. So, you know, when my husband comes home, um, and I use this example in my TED talk, he comes home with five ripe bananas. Mm-hmm. He comes home with five overripe bananas. And I'm furious because, you know, I know that three of them are going to end up in the compost bin that I start a big fight with him. And really it's not exactly about his banana shopping, although yes, Karen, he should change his banana shopping, but you know, it's because I'm anxious, I'm feeling bad about myself. So I'm gonna start getting really judgmental about other people. So when you ask the question, what is our anger signaling? What what is it? What's the real issue? And what should we do with it? The dilemma here is that people who are angry, they just act. We just react. And we often don't calm down first to really think about, well, what is the real issue here? What am I angry about? Who's responsible for what? And what do I hope to accomplish here? And what is the best way to go about it? So our anger gets us in a whole lot of trouble because, you know, I was raised, I don't know if you were Karen, I was raised on this anger in, anger out theory that Mm -hmm. if you keep it in, you're going to get depressed and you're going to get sick. So let it out, you know, and that's going to solve everything. Um, That is not true. And I was raised with an abusive father whose anger caused immense damage. So, you know, it can be quite a dilemma. And I have just a little side question. There's Mm -hmm. some... There's some out there who say anger is not a real emotion. It's a shield for hurt or fear. But are you saying that anger is its own real pure emotion? Yes. Now, it's true that anger, underlying anger, of course, can be hurt if you are the object of a racist comment, it's not an either or thing. Your your anger is important. It's legitimate. It's a signal to you to want to push against that and, and to be able to say to yourself, to others, to join together collectively, to, to need what you know, to do what needs to be done to to make sure this has to stop happening. Underneath it, underneath that, is there hurt? I mean, of course there's hurt. You know, there there are generations of racism then hurting people, you know, in, in our family, the most brutal kinds of hurt. But it's not either or. I mean, yes, there can be hurt underlying anger. Yes, there's anger underlying hurt. It's not one or the other. These are all legitimate, real emotions. Absolutely. So that leads us to kind of, in some ways, the question behind the question behind the question, which is, how can we use anger as a tool for change, changing our relationships, 
changing the stories we have about our relationships. And I wonder if you could share some do's and don'ts, especially what's required of us to use anger from a place of a place of courage, a place of connection. That is a great question. So let me give you some do's and don'ts. These are not in an order of preference. And I would say to our listeners that if you pick one or two of these things to work on, that and you stick with them, that would be great. Um, I'm a big believer in small change. Mm -hmm. It's the direction of change that counts, not the not the speed of change. Because when people try to do too much, they often accomplish nothing at all. It just stirs up too much anxiety. So if you're listening. If one of these things catches your attention, let that be your homework. So where to begin? Okay, here's some like basic communication rules, I would say. Don't use below the bell tactics when you're angry. This means what are below the bell tactics? These include blaming, interpreting, diagnosing, labeling, psychoanalyzing, preaching, moralizing, ridiculing, lecturing, all of these things we do, don't do them. I'd also say never use email or text to confront another person or try to process an emotional issue. Yeah, I've got to interrupt and say, amen, amen, amen. And right, keep- right. As a therapist, I'm always saying, don't click send. Email, no matter how well you thought you've written it, it will always be read um, in a way that you may not have intended it. It just, don't do it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and a good communication tip a good do is to speak in I language. Learn to say, I think, I feel, I want. Um, And an I statement is saying something about the self without criticizing or blaming the other person and without holding them responsible for Mm -hmm. our feelings. And you have to watch out for disguised you statements or pseudo I statements, like, I think that you need to control everything. That's not an I statement, just because you've started out with (laughs) I think. Um, The other thing which we've been talking about, Karen, is strike when the iron is cold. In other words, calm down first. No one can think clearly in the midst of a tornado. So if you're wanting to open a difficult conversation with someone, get a grip on your own reactivity and intensity first so that you can put on your maturity seatbelt and you can make wise decisions about how and when to say what to whom. Now, there's certain relationships, especially with people who live under the same roof with you, like a partner or a kid. I mean, you know, of course, there are times when you're just going to lose it. And if they're under the same roof, you'll also have time or perhaps the opportunity to repair it. Mm -hmm. But coming down first and being very thoughtful is especially important if you don't have the opportunity for that dailiness of repair say it's a work situation, a family visit, a friend who might be very themselves, you know, sort of um, not, you know, a very defensive person. I mean, we're all defensive when we're being criticized, but so strike when the iron is cold. And the other thing that's required 
and this is the hardest one, to really be able to enlarge your true story about yourself, the other person, and what's possible in a relationship. You not only have to lower your reactivity, but you have to get very self-focused. As a therapist, I can tell you that nothing will change in any relationship, mother, daughter, two partners, parent, child, nothing will change in a relationship if there's not one person who doesn't get self-focused. And what I mean by self-focused is not self-blaming, but the ability to observe a pattern, what is happening in this interaction, and then change our part in the pattern that's bringing us change. Okay, that's self-focus. Because when we're angry, we automatically blame the other person. We automatically want that other person to be fixed. And even if you're 2%, you know, you, you say, okay, I'm, I'm just 2% to blame here. That is the only 2% that you can change. And people who show the most flexibility um, for getting unstuck, whether it's unstuck from their own story, unstuck from a relationship pattern, are able to shift from blaming the other person to getting curious about how they might move differently in the relationship as an experiment to see what might happen. And that is so hard, Karen, yeah. because when we're angry, we will, and we're not getting the results we want, whatever it is, we're over-functioning for a kid, we're pursuing a distant partner, we are distancing ourselves rather than being able to move towards whatever it is we're doing that's not working. Do we stop and do something different? No. You, I mean, even rats in a maze will learn to change their behavior if they keep hitting a dead end. But in this regard, we are less intelligent than laboratory animals. So it takes a huge amount of calming down and then curiosity and inventiveness to do something different. And it can be a very small thing. Should I give you an example here? Or do you want to give an example? I would love to give an example. And I also want to throw in a quote from Pema Chodron, who's a Buddhist nun and writer who I turn to a lot. Well, maybe it's not a quote, it's a paraphrase. She talks about seeing your habitual patterns, and then trying something new. And then she says, it may be a disaster, but at least it'll be fresh. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. so yes, please share an example. Well, let's see. Here's an example that might seem small. Um, I was working with a couple and one of the places where they would have a repetitive fight is every time they would visit his parents, which was often the husband would get caught in the same political argument with his father. His father was a Trump supporter. Her husband was very progressive in his views. And then they would leave the dinner and the wife would just be so critical of the husband for getting into the same stupid fight with his father, and then they would fight, you know, they would have a fight going back in the car. An example of what the wife did differently, which was very creative, was, so the same thing happened at the dinner, and the thought, her husband 
and his father got into another fight that, of course, was going nowhere. This time, when they got in the car, instead of criticizing her husband, she said to him, you know, John, I've really been thinking about how much I admire the fact that you and your family can have such profound differences and you still stay connected. You know, you don't cut off. We go back for dinner. And as I think about it, this is exactly the lesson that I would like to to teach our son. You know, that even when there are really, really difficult family members, that one can have the, the courage and the motivation to not cut off and to find some way to stay connected. And of course, the husband nearly drove off the road because he knew that criticism was going to be coming. And instead, she really found something to positivize about about the relationship. And it's, it's really interesting, Karen, when people are angry, they, they get locked into not only a very narrow story, but very narrow behaviors. They don't experiment in something very creative. And even when you think you've tried everything, there's always something new to do. And I have to tell you one more story because it just came uh-huh. to mind yes. to do that um, because I love this story in terms of creativity of doing the unexpected. There's an old folk tale about a man, an old man, who was very bothered by noisy boys who would play outside his window. So he called the boys to his side and he told them that he would give each one of them 50 cents if they would continue to play noisily outside his window. He told them he loved to hear them play noisily, but he was an old man and he was hard of hearing. So they would have to make a real effort to play noisily to earn their 50 cents. So the boys thought that was great. And they came back the next day, he gave them each 50 cents. But when they came back the following day, he only gave them 20 cents. And he said he was really sorry, but he just didn't have enough money. And when they came back the third day, he gave them only a nickel. And he said he was really sorry, but he was running out of money. And that's all he had. And the boys refused to come back, you know, because they weren't (laughs) going to be... uh, you know, screwed over by this stupid old man. And it, you know, it's, it's just a wonderful example of the kind of creativity people can have when they limber up their brains. Now in relationships, it's, it's very complicated because um, that's a story if you wanted to get rid of the kids and in relationships, We don't just want to try any experiment like, oh, let's throw red paint at Aunt Mary and see what happens. We want to try experiments that can enlarge our story and give us an enhanced sense of what's possible and really test out what's possible um, in a relationship. So... I've been talking for a long time. Do you have a question for me? Well, I have kind of a comment. As you were talking, I was thinking about so many things. And, um, you know, your book came out the same year I got married. So this 36-year-old book and 36-year-old marriage have, have kind of been through many, many manifestations, you might say. And I remember there was a time when I had breast cancer and was going through chemo. And I got incredibly angry, just full of rage, looking around our house at what a total mess everything was. And, you know, let's just say 
I'm not the most anal retentive housekeeper in the world. Uh-huh. And, uh, I lost it. I just started screaming at Ken. I screamed at all my children who were young at the time. And then, you know, eventually I went to the bedroom and fell apart and couldn't stop crying. And Ken said to me, any change we want to make, it's going to be small steps and we're going to fail over and over again. And we're going to have to just be tender and understanding that we're trying to make positive change, but it's inevitable that we will screw up sometimes. And it's inevitable we'll get angry and lose control, but we'll just kind of keep at it. And that has just stayed with me for years that making these changes can be very incremental, don't you think? Yes, they're incremental. And it doesn't take something as large as breast cancer and survival anxiety to make us, you know, throw a fit that, yes, you know, that the house is a mess or something is out of place. And that what can said to you is so important, which is, he's really saying, I'm your partner. I'm here yes. for the long haul. We're going to make mistakes. Um, you know, we're going to have stupid fights. And I am here. I am here for you. And you can count on me. And that story, I love that story also, because real substantive change is a long term process. And you're trying to change a pattern and we're all going to get derailed and backtrack and, and the challenge is to get back on track again, um, because we're all going to lose it. And often when we make a change, we want to get a positive response and we want to get it right away. So if I make a change, say a very brave thing, and I say to my mother, say that I'm very angry at my mother because she's so demanding and I'm able to get self-focused and I realize that my real challenge is to be able to get clear about what I can and can't do for her. So I do something very brave, you know, and I go to her and I say, mom, you know, we've been fighting and, and things have gotten kind of intense and I've had a big part in this. And I've been thinking more about what I can and can't do for you. So let me tell you what, you know, what I realize about sort of what I can do and what I can't do. And I start to define some limits. It's not like my mom is going to say, wow, how great, you know, that, uh -huh. that now you're becoming such an assertive person and you're telling me that you can't do the grocery shopping just because I call you and say, I have to have this right away. How great you're being, you know, having so much self and telling me it doesn't work that way. You know, in fact, we get a counter move and the person says, you can't mean that you're selfish. How can you say that? And, and it's really a long term project to not only be able to make the initial change, but to be able to hold to that change without getting defensive or attacking or blaming when our mother or partner or child, whoever says, how can you say that? You're so selfish. I can't believe you're going to tell dad that, you know, how can you say that about yourself when you know it's going to kill your mother, you know, that you're able to hang in there and say, you know, it, it may be selfish. It is what I need to do for myself. And, you know, this is something that, that I need to say to, to mom and, and I do need to do that. It, it's not, you know, all of us want a hit and run sort of confrontation and change. And sometimes that happens. But often it's a long distance run. And uh, yeah, so you got to prepare for that. So much. And I have one final question. My notion is that we often cannot find 
the true stories of our lives, the deep realities, unless we dwell in uncertainty, which can be completely uncomfortable, even painful, and certainly anxiety ridden. You write, it is an act of courage to acknowledge our own uncertainty and sit with it for a while. Related to this, how did you find the courage and presence to tunnel through and sit with enough uncertainty, enough lifting of conventional and habitual responses to anger, particularly what a therapist should tell a patient, to discover about anger and change? Well, I should confess because people read my books and they think that uh, I move through the world like some kind of saint-like or Buddhist-like person. Um, And I am always honest about the fact that if my readers or my therapy clients or, you know, could see me at my worst, most reactive moments uh, with my with my kids, especially you know before they were lunch, um, or with Steve, if they could see me at my, if they were fly on the wall and saw me at my worst moments, they would never buy my books. You know, they would never <laughs> see me as a therapist. So we all have very very different levels of functioning, and I think. You know, what really put me on a a track of um, more uncertainty and and courage is, and this would be a much longer story, a whole new podcast, but um, I was in a crisis way back. Uh, This was before I wrote The Dance of Anger. And... um, A friend of mine who was really, uh, Kay Kent from Topeka, really a brilliant family systems coach, encouraged me to work on a triangle in my family of origin. And the triangle involved the fact that I was in my mother's camp, always criticizing my father. Mm -hmm. Uh, My mother would be off the plane for five minutes and she would be saying to me, let me tell you what your father has done now. You know, when I was her ally, I was waving her banner. And of course, my father was doing his part, you know, very much in, in my agreeing with her of what, what a jerk he was. But when uh, Kay Kent encouraged me to work on this triangle, to do something different when my mother would just criticize my father to me, which started to fill me with anxiety. I almost felt like there was a shunt going from my mother's body to my body because she would talk so intensely about my father. And I wanted to say, and sometimes did say, like, this is a marital issue, go deal with this. But when I worked, and this work was over a very long period of time to change my part in the triangle, which I talk about in the dance of anger how do you change your part in the triangle everything changed including my ability to stop blaming people and to really look at the patterns in which we all participate so rather than as a therapist my saying wow that poor distancing husband well the nagging wife is to blame because she nags him And, you know, so of course he distances and of course he started to shut her out or the opposite, that poor wife, you know, Uh poor wife, the husband distances, he's unavailable to her. Of course, she's more anxious and she's pursuing that I could see the pattern. The more she pursues, the more he's going to distance, the more he distances, the more she's going to pursue who can change their part in that pattern. It doesn't really matter It's the one I have in my office I'm going to work with. But I guess, you know, I'm giving this very long-winded answer, but it was my work that I did with the help of Kay Kent on that particular triangle 
um, of not waving my mother's banner and learning more about my dad and forming a one-to-one relationship with him, um, despite how difficult a father he was, and also being able to speak to that, that that, that somehow shifted a lot for me. I mm-hmm. It was like, you know, if you have a foggy windshield and, and then it gets cleared off, and you didn't even realize it was foggy or you didn't realize you had to, you know, clean your, your eyeglasses. So what I did in the Dance of Anger is challenge people to make a change. And you need the uncertainty. You need the, the curiosity. You need the courage to stop fixating on what the other person is wrong and get really curious about something you can do differently. And things, one change leads to another. You can start with something very small. And that's what's so scary about change because it's easy to make one change, but it's hard to make only one. So if you change one thing and it's a really significant change, even if it's little, you're gonna feel an internal pressure to maybe make another change. Mm -hmm. And like you said, right at the start, Karen, change is an anxiety and scary business for all of us, even when we're pushing for it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your generosity in this interview. And with so many, uh, it's actually millions of people around the world that in all your writing, you've kind of given us a lot of pathways to just look at, okay, what is in my power to change? What is in my power to at least get curious about? And I really appreciate you so much as a friend and so much as a writer and change maker in this world. So thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Karen. And I love you, you too. I love you too. To the sound of your own heartbeat, singing, Hey, singing, Hey. Thank you so much for listening to Tell Me Your Truest Story. Please subscribe to my podcast at KarenMiriamGoldberg.Podbean.com or visit my website for the link to find out more about workshops, writings, happenings, and my latest blog post at KarenMiriamGoldberg.com. That's C-A-R-Y-N-M-I-R-R-I-A-M-G-O-L-D-B-E-R-G. You can also find Tell Me Your Truest Story on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Special thanks to Kelly Hunt for the use of her music from our co-written song, The Road is Just a River. And please catch up with more of Kelly's music at kellyhunt.com. That's Kelly with two E's, K-E-L-L-E-Y. Thank you to Diana Burrup for our logo. May you find greater truth and joy, peace and wonder in your own truest stories.